the real tank genius of World War II, Percy Hobo Hobart by the Fat Electrician. Always love me some World War II history. It's going to be a fun one. When I started this video, I just wanted to know how the tanks made it onto the beaches at D-Day. And what I found instead is one of the greatest anti-hero stories of all time. And it rewrote my understanding of history. That's kind of amazing, though. And I absolutely love that he just brings up stuff like this. Like, this is kind of his thing. Like, hey, did you actually realize that a lot of this happened? Or, hey, you know, we all kind of assumed this, but it's actually this instead. And that is just next level to me. In, in a world that is so fraught with disinformation, misinformation, trolling, you know, uh, purposely not caring or being ignorant of facts, and, and with someone that is teachers as friends, right? I mean, I go through... I've heard a lot of that. You know, you can have a test on Africa and your students are talking about the Inca tribes from, uh, you know, the Native Americas. There, there's a definite amount of not caring <laughs> in in uh, modern day. So it's always good to see information like this, history like this, being presented in such a way. Today, we're talking about the man that quite literally wrote the book on armored warfare, a World War I veteran that was forced into early retirement because his fellow officers didn't like him very much. Wow. But after German tanks rampaged through France and North Africa, utilizing their new Blitzkrieg tactic, when Winston Churchill himself would call upon this man to leave retirement and go toe to toe with the infamous German tank commanders Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian. Ladies and gentlemen, Rommel is definitely talked about. So, in regards to Blitzkrieg, I mean, there is it, it for the time and arguably still today is <clears throat> very meta. It's very meta defining in terms of warfare. And as far as uh, this starts getting into some modern history and understand one, that I'm a civilian two I do not uh, speak authoritatively on military affairs, nor do I have the expertise Just clarifying that really quick. As far as I'm aware and have had conversations in regards to even uh, Operation Desert Storm and stuff like that, you know, there's uh, light lightning warfare is kind of a normalized thing. And you even see this in games, you see this in simulations, and I'm sure you see this in real battlefield tactics. Those of you that have uh, experience in the military, and I'm sure are probably under some OPSEC, well, can probably agree, not necessarily disclose, but probably agree. Like, yeah, no, I mean, if you just come at somebody with just a lightning offensive, just a sheer overwhelming force of aggression and offense you know, it's it's hard to mount up a resistance to that and that's what world war ii germany did utilize i mean it was fast it was hard hitting it was Im near impossible to mount a proper defense and you know i've heard rumors not that i can substantiate any of this but uh intercepting certain missiles and stuff like that it's what well, there certain classes of them could potentially go so fast or it's it's just too difficult to intercept it but yeah you know it may get through but the retaliation is the other half of that the retaliation on something like that would be tenfold it's about to get proportional so to speak and the hero of d-day that you've probably never heard of major general sir percy cleghorn stanley hobart aka hobo but first that man looks like an absolute genius. We're going to get into the ad read. From our sponsor, this video is brought to you by Delete Me. Delete Me is an online subscription service. It's a very straightforward, simple business. You give them money, they get rid of your personal information off the internet. Okay, look, here's the deal. Somehow, some way, your personal information is on the internet. Your name, your spouse's yes. name, your parents' name, your address, your last five addresses, your phone numbers, and all of your emails are all sitting in some data broker's bank, and they're selling that information for money. But the good... As somebody that worked in finance as well, and uh, as somebody that had to go through uh, training training in certain aspects. Did I work with a fraud team? No, I worked kind of adjacent to them. But uh, in regards to selling information, I mean, you can absolutely buy information on people in bulk, whether it's complete profiles, partial profiles, partial information, you know, say, for example, oh, I have this person's name and a phone number, right? And you can just buy that in bulk. As far as I'm aware, this gets into some legally gray territory. And, uh, you know, w that specifically in that training course was about dark web and, you know, kind of gray web buying of information, buying and selling and brokering of information. And and that leads into the unfortunate instance where, unfortunately, all too often, you get a letter in the mail saying, hey, thank you for signing the overdraft protection agreement. You're like, I've never heard of you guys. What is happening? Why are you sending me a thing? I don't have an account with you. Oh, actually, uh, about that, someone did use your information uh, to uh, make an account. We have taken care of it. And uh, please disregard that notice. And it, there's certain things that the institution can and can't give you, which we, we've gone over a few times on stream, which I think is incredibly unfair. Like if somebody steals your identity and uses that at a bank and the bank can't tell you who it was so you can give them a piece of your mind, I think that's protecting the wrong person here. And then you have to go to the credit bureaus and stuff like that. But no, this this 100% tracks. And I, I'm very 
happy to see this as a sponsor. The news is that these data brokers are legally required to delete your information if you submit an opt-out request. And that's where Delete Me comes in. They will go to all the big data brokers and automatically submit opt-out requests on your behalf and you don't have to do anything. And I know what you're thinking because I thought the same thing. I don't want to give all my personal information to Delete Me either because that just seems counterproductive. Okay, here's mm. the thing with that. You don't have to give them all your private information. You can literally give them your name and your email address. You can give them more information if you want, but really all they need is your name and email and then you come back a few days later and they just start asking you a bunch of yes or no questions by using just your name and email they'll search through all the data banks and figure out who you are and they'll ask you a bunch of weird questions like is this your dad is this your mom is that a relative is this your address did you right. used to live here did you grow up at this address is this your phone number is this your email they know all of this information just by you giving them your name and email using all the information that these data brokers have and then you just so that's actually a thing that i don't think a lot of people know and that's actually why Logan Paul gotten a little bit of fire in regards to the reason I feel that the crypto zoo calling out of CoffeeZilla was redacted was not because of necessarily saying that he was going to pursue litigation against CoffeeZilla. That that's par for the course for him, in my opinion. What it was was that a he revealed an expunged record that was supposed to be sealed. And the fact that Logan Paul can just come out with something like that very easily, and I feel that that got him legal hot water. And in my opinion with the experience that I've, that is what led to the redaction of that video. That being said, if you have, you know, context on that, if you think I'm on, you know, on point, if you don't think I'm on point, definitely let me know in the comment section, please. Any NDAs and OPSEC, all that fun stuff, whenever you do comment, please observe that. But uh, no, it's very, very easy. And that's actually why when I talk to copyright companies, I was talking to a copyright company recently, and uh, I, I caught them in, uh, in a little bit of a, a faux pas, a lie, if you will, because they said, oh, well, we don't have your, we don't have your personal identifying information. This is all we have. And I go, Actually, do not lie to me again, because I know the counterclaims process. I have to submit my legal name to you. And using my legal name, you can search entire databases for my personal identifying information. Do not lie to me again. You have my personal identifying information. Let us move forward with this, to which they haven't answered back because, oh, this issue's closed. But I, regardless, what the point that I'm trying to get across is it is very easy to find information and that is a problem which is why when you're looking at you know data brokers from a legal standpoint you know yes they have to you know uh, honor an opt-out request and this is a service why delete me comes into play and even then the fat electrician anything that he is sponsored by anything that he is uh, you know endorsing honestly gets you know a step up in my book because how many times have we seen an influencer how many times have we seen a big streamer twitch streamer even and they're they're you know it's this new product every week or they're peddling hey you too can learn all this stuff from this thing that i'm selling you or you too can eat this by selling you this and it just feels so homogenized and disingenuous and something comes out about the product later that electrician is straight to the point no bs and so that does help with these ad reads if you want uh my perspective on that i respect let it let them know yes that's me and then they will delete all that information for you a couple days after that they're going to send you a report here was mine over 70 data brokers had my information and there were 489 listings where that information was for sale and delete me submitted opt-out requests for all of them now those data brokers are probably going to be able to get my information again but delete right. me is constantly going to be searching for my info and automatically submitting the requests as soon as those listings pop up go check out delete me i'll have a link and a discount code down below let's get back to the video percy hobart was born in very i lengthened that very quick to the point no bs 10 10 ad read in india in 1885 and joined the british military in 1902 he would then go on to fight in world war one while there in typical anti-hero fashion he made a name for himself as being extremely effective but unorthodox and disobedient at the same time because of this many of the other british officers don't really care for him despite that he makes it through world war one ends up earning himself a military cross and then in 1919 he goes off to college graduates from mm -hmm. college four years later in 1923 he then then volunteers to be an officer in the Royal Tank Corps. Now, he volunteered because most people did not want this position. And that's right. because at this point in time, a lot of the high-ranking British officers didn't see the true potential that tanks and armored vehicles had. They simply viewed them as a single tool for trench warfare to get from one trench to the other. They didn't It's so interesting to see how this evolved actually because I, I could absolutely see that. I could absolutely see how this is to get from point A to point B uh, from trench to trench warfare. And trench warfare, you know, is for all intents and purposes, as far as I'm aware, was abandoned and going into World War II. I'm sure there were trenches, or I'm sure that there were, uh, you know, enforcements, reinforcements, uh, things of the like that may have been used in certain skirmishes. But 
you know, I could absolutely see how you're having to use an armored vehicle to go from trench to trench across no man's land. And now even today in what I would argue is a very naval and air force dependent war games meta, so to speak, right? Where, yes, if you have air superiority, you generally kind of want to keep that. Or if you have naval superiority in a conflict near a, a, near a border, near a uh, you know body of water, I, I would argue that could be something you could have as well that would be beneficial to the situation. But, uh, I mean, we still have, what, the M1 Abrams even today? That, uh... What was, what was the Mike Burnfire video? Something about an Abrams is a small arms. If you haven't seen Mike Burnfire, check him out. But, yeah, no, it's, uh interesting that even today there is still a place for tanks that they just kind of evolve with the metagame so to speak didn't realize that one day it was going to replace cavalry. Percy Hobart, on the other hand, was a visionary and saw its true potential, and that's why he volunteered. Not only that, he was also very vocal about this opinion, and he would actually persuade a lot of the younger soldiers to believe the same thing, which honestly isn't a very hard sell. The new guy joins the army, and you're like, hey, quick question. Did you want to ride a horse into battle, or did you want to drive a fucking tank? Right. Hey, everybody's picking a tank. And over time, his advocacy for change ends up making a lot of the old cavalry officers end up hating him because he's kind of trying to make them obsolete. And you have to remember, at this point in time, the British officer corps is very, very clicky, like they're socialites and gentlemen, and they have to, you know, conduct themselves in a certain manner and all that BS. So when Hobart comes in and starts ruffling feathers, it upsets the entire officer corps, and they all pretty much hate him at this point. Despite this makes me really... I want to know if international joint ops are a thing. Like, I mean, every company... It's almost every not every company i hope it's not every company every country has war games and demonstrations and stuff like that right so i i would assume at that uh you know we would have joint exercises with potentially like the british military or joint exercises with the german military uh or even what is it uh the jdf japan's current thing i'm sorry i can't remember offhand please definitely clarify that on this uh, comment section but yeah like i mean a I, I joint international war games between friendly countries right i would absolutely love to know how interactions go between like the usmc and like british uh the british equivalent or like the german equivalent that would be really funny to hear but i don't know if that's necessarily a thing i mean it, it would make sense to me you know oh we're going to strengthen international ties but then again I mean, I, I constantly make jokes and I respect it that Marines can send a washing machine across state lines in three different places. I don't know how much more power the international community could give them with access to more interesting things too. Despite that, he knows he's right and he just keeps working on pioneering new tactics and new applications for tanks. Now, one of the few legitimate concerns about having tanks on the battlefield at this point in time was that they were basically autonomous. And what I mean by yeah. that is once the tank crew got their orders, hopped in the tank and took off, that was it because tanks didn't have radios and stuff yet at this point in time. So once they left, you couldn't call them back. You couldn't change up the mission. They couldn't communicate with anybody outside of that tank. So Hobart comes out and he's like, well, hey, rather than not using tanks because they can't communicate, how about we just, I don't know, put some radios inside of them. So he fights tooth and nail for like a year to make that happen, gets radios put in all of his tanks and then trains his guys how to run battle drills, being able to actually communicate with each other and the chain of command. And guess what? It works exactly how you would expect it to. I mean, this is the upside down ketchup bottle of the tank world. Like somebody yeah. finally came out with this idea and everybody's like, how? How did I not come up with that billion dollar idea? At this point- Well, so on that, I mean, who are the two most knowledgeable people when it comes to anything, right? The person that's, you know, the, the doctor in the room, person that's been doing this for 10,000 hours and the person fresh out of med school or the person that's just new into something, right? How many times have you played a video game and you hop on in and you're just like, why aren't people using this? And I mean, it's kind of a sleeper hit or you hop in and you're like, well, why don't we use this? And then someone that's been playing the game for 10,000 hours goes, well, it is a good thing. You know, you can use it. However, it is limited in these capacities. And therefore, there are just better options in ABC, XYZ that you could use in instead because it just does the job a whole lot better. Right. I mean, it, it, it comes down to that. I, people in general will get into a certain way of thinking until something comes along to disrupt that and that's where you start getting anti-meta you start getting disruption into a format when it comes to a game video game type scenario right in re in reality it's just people not necessarily that they echo chamber right but that people think about their own things and it's like okay this is how you do this until someone comes along and it's like well why are we climbing this we could just put a ladder here like why are we having to do this whole rigmarole over here and someone goes ah that makes sense right so two best perspectives to have the person that's been doing it for 10,000 hours or the doctor 
and the person fresh out of med school or the person that's just new into something, they will always have insight. When all the junior officers and lower enlisted are like, holy shit, this is awesome. And all the older, more experienced officers that already hated Hobart lose their shit because he's now actively making them look stupid. What are those? <laughs> you are wearing <laughs> That movie just goes way more hard the more I age. Like, Hades is an absolute just mood. So once that gets worked out, he starts developing legitimate battle strategies and drills and training his men on how to conduct tank warfare, <laughs> how to integrate tanks with infantry, really laying the groundwork for what would become modern tank warfare. This goes on for a couple of years, and then in 1927, he ends up being a co-respondent in a divorce case. Now, I'll be honest, mm -hmm. I had to Google what that meant, but apparently co-respondent is the fancy British officer polite way of saying Percy Hobart was banging somebody else's wife. Her Ooh. name is Dorothea Field, and of course, she was another British officer's wife. Naughty, naughty. After that divorce is finalized, Dorothea and Percy get married pretty much immediately, and the rest of the officer corps now absolutely hates him, and they actively try to get him kicked out of the military because this is not gentlemanly behavior. They're not able to get- Right, I mean, this comes down to just like, even outside of a military setting, right? I, and I'm sure there are many military personnel in the comment section that can chime in and uh, how this affects things on base, how this affects things in the unit, how this affects things you know, in, in your workplace, absolutely. I am not authorized or qualified to speak on that. What I can speak on is in the civilian side of things, right? You're working at a box store, you're working at an office, right? You're working at something else, you got the holiday party, someone gets a little too tipsy, suddenly you know, your coworker and uh, another coworker's wife, they have at it in the, uh, the restroom stall, right? And it just turns into this weird mess, and then you get certain people that would either will polarize in the workplace certain people will be firmly against the person that did it the other will be you know firmly for the person that did it and you know oh well this is just someone else's fault and it ends up polarizing an entire office or workspace and just leads to a whole lot of just like drama and then you have me it's just like look i i get it but like can we just can we just not can we think with our heads you know the ones on top of our shoulders can we just, can we think with those for like five minutes and why this potentially would be a bad idea right I, I, then again, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes you just have moments, I guess. Don Hobart stays in the military and continues to develop and refine armored warfare. And one of the things he starts to do is look back into history and see if there's any lessons that he can apply to tank warfare. And one of the things that he hones in on is the Mongols. The Mongols were so oh successful my God. because they utilized cavalry to strike deep into enemy territory at strategic points, weakening their entire empire. And Hobart mm -hmm. says, what if I could do the same thing, but with tanks? And to the Mongols are actually a huge discussion as far as I'm aware beyond, uh, beyond just like a, oh, they're the Mongols, the Mongol Empire, that's kind of how they did, is with friends that are history teachers, friends that absolutely love to study history, even in the SCA, people love to study history, that the Mon Mongol Empire kind of just like defies all of our points on how a society is made. Like you have to have, uh, what was I think one of it's like uh, sustainable agriculture. Another one of them is you have to have, you know, uh, your your permanent structures, that kind of thing. There are way better people who are way more qualified to speak on that than I am, and I encourage that discussion in the comments. What I can say is that there are multiple teachers that I know that have just agreed. Yeah, no, like the Mongols are like the one instance that like this just kind of breaks all of our like notions and like all of our like this is how a society forms. This is how a society works. And it's super fascinating to them. Anybody that knows a lot about history, that sounds an awful lot like the German Blitzkrieg tactic, mm -hmm. and that's because it is. Yeah, the Germans didn't come up with the Blitzkrieg. Percy Hobart did. Heinz Gedermann, the German tank commander that is the architect of the Blitzkrieg, is well known to have had every single paper that Percy Hobart published translated into German, and he kept that with him everywhere he went. Yeah, the uh, so here's the thing. One, if it ain't stupid, and it works, well, sorry, if it works, it ain't stupid, right? Second, I mean, w I would argue World War II popularized the Blitzkrieg as we're having this discussion here in Fat Electrician is saying, actually, he is not credited with creating, he's architecting the World War II German version of the Blitzkrieg. Yes, absolutely. But he did take inspiration from elsewhere. And that is 
if it works, it ain't stupid. And sometimes you can find value in something that everyone else says, nah, it's kind of boring or nah, this is uh, you know, not really worth it. And you can just absolutely spin it into something that just works, right? Like I have a copy of The Art of War. I have a copy of The Five Rings by Mimoto Musashi, right? Is that necessarily on everybody's bookshelf? No. But I know if I pick it up, I'm going to learn something of value I, in, on either of them. I could pick up the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. And considering the time uh, area, the time period it was written in, right, or even Wealth of Nations, right, I can pick these up and I can go, okay, this is what they're trying to get across. And you can take something of value out of it. And then you thus are ed further educated to have an educated opinion. That's how That's how this works. That's how, one, keeping cool stuff around works. And two, just like having access to the source material so if someone you know someone goes off and goes oh well wealth of nations isn't actually you know a good read or anything like that one have a copy of it two i haven't read it personally but i have heard many 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 good things about uh, the wealth of nations and even marcus aurelius actually here that's a great philosophical work uh by marcus aurelius and you just have them on hand it also looks cool because you got a bunch of cool books on the shelf and you can start quoting some of that and it makes you look way smarter the infamous German tank commanders Rommel and Gedermann didn't revolutionize armored warfare. They just copied Hobart's homework. So if yeah. Percy Hobart is the actual genius behind the Blitzkrieg, why don't most people know that? Why does everybody give Germany credit and why didn't the British use it first? Or at the very least, know that it was a possibility when it was used against them in France when they got their asses beat in six weeks. That is because the British chain of command hated the man that came up with the Blitzkrieg <laughs> and for that reason made the entire strategy a failure. In 1934, Britain conducted a large training exercise where Percy Hobart was going to be allowed to try out his new methods. Oh, if you no. don't know, when you're conducting Conducting a large military training exercise, you have like team A, team B, and then you have the umpires, so to speak. You have the people making sure that both teams are doing the right things, saying, yeah, that works. No, that doesn't work. Declaring who wins and who loses. The um I would absolutely love to see these. Like, I'm sure that's under some sort of NDA or OPSEC most of the time, at least for sensitive operations, right? So it's like SEAL Team 6, right? It, it, training for that or any sort of planning for that or any sort of critiquing on strategies that led to that would probably be under a little bit of lock and key and rightly outside of the, you know, purvey of civilians like myself. You know, I, I, I always consistently, you know, think about what happens if you have, you know, a, a platoon or two of USMC going against, you know, uh, US Army, or if you get the Air Force out for some of these war games and have some of these uh, situations, right? Like these always fascinate me, even, the, even though they're just simulations, right? Or even they could just even if they're just training exercises, you know, just like seeing how units move and seeing how things come together in actuality. Because, I mean, it, on paper, I mean, how many times have you done something and it comes out completely different once it's off paper in actual reality? These things always interest me because there's a number of factors that can change from test to test alone. And then you have to try and figure out how do you get these consistent results? And, you know, uh, you, the, the people that are umpiring, so to speak, they're critiquing it. Then what qualifications do they have? You know, uh, what are they seeing that other people don't see? That would be the kind of person I would have a, a, a chat with <laughs> over a beer, right? Just a lot of interesting things I'm sure they could say. It's it. This has always fascinated me. And it is a good way of just teaching. I mean, uh, military history in uh, Idaho, right? Uh, 12th grade specifically. I mean, we just built out of cardboard and duct tape, you know, Spartan shields and uh, little gladiuses. And, you know, we got to be, oh, yeah, yeah, this is how 300 works. Got it. Makes sense, right? Just sometimes doing is better than just looking at it. Empires conspired against Hobart because they were military officers and they didn't like him and basically made his entire strategy fail. Fast forward 1937, Hobart is given command of the 1st Armored Division, Great Britain's first modern tank division. Because of this, a bunch of British officers promptly throw a bitch fit and try to get Hobart kicked out of the military again. It yeah. fails again, but the chain of command has to come up with a compromise, and that compromise is to take Hobart and send him down to Egypt where he can take command of the 2nd Armored Division, which was basically, we're going to ship him half way across the world and then pretend he doesn't exist <laughs> out of sight out of mind yeah. right so hobart gets down to egypt How, how's that object permanence treating you <laughs> it is a complete shit show because tanks are effectively replacing cavalry at this point so it's cavalry officers that are running tank divisions and they have chosen to not read any of the literature or training material that he has spent the last decade developing and they are operating tanks like they are dragoons if you don't know a dragoon is kind of like cavalry except it's it's not they ride in on horses and then they dismount and go into battle on foot and that's what the second oh that makes sense okay i actually wasn't sure what those were 
armor division is being trained to do. They roll up in the tank and then the gunner and the loader stay in the tank while the rest of the crew gets out and fights like infantry. Well I mean, they're just, they're running it just like an armed carrier at that point, right? You show up in the tank, you watch everyone clown car out of the tank, and then you have the one person that's just manning the main, uh, the main gun, right? So I, I can understand how they're getting to that logic. World War II, though, like... That, that just feels like you're just going to a meat grinder, depending on what theater you're in. Well, being Egypt. a static target instead of a moving target, which mm -hmm. is the entire point of being a fucking tank. The chain of command is effectively trying to do everything they can to make tanks look bad and ineffective because by extension, it makes Hobart look bad and ineffective. The running joke when Hobart gets there is that the Egyptian force is the Egyptian farce and the mobile division is the immobile division. <laughs> but when Hobart yeah. shows up, he turns the entire thing around. Between 1930 and 1940, he trains this entire division how to actually conduct tank warfare and they get super effective at it and the men absolutely love him because percy hobart is not only a great teacher but he actually wants every man under his command to understand what they are doing and why they are doing it when at this point in time many other officers don't care about that they just want you to shut up and follow orders but percy hobart wants you to know what you should be doing and why you should be doing it that way if the chain yeah. of command ever fails you can make intelligent decisions regarding what needs to be done in short i mean i would just say anybody else even outside of military just be able to make your own cognizant decisions because what happens if your manager isn't there what happens if your manager has to call out sick what happens if your manager just quits what happens if like you know somebody that you're relying upon for say your insurance agent or your uh your investment broker right what if they just quit one day like, yes, if it's an insurance thing or you're paying a company for a service, generally someone will take over that and that's your work with the new agent. But at the same time, you can be like, well, I mean, I'm going to make my own decisions at this point in time because, you know, one, why did they quit Two, you know, what are the factors here? And oh, darn, my manager isn't here. Instead of having a panic attack, you're just like, look, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I know more than my manager at this point. Let's just get this done. And then you take charge of the situation and you do it. It's just a part of being a well-rounded individual. Should you take charge every single time? No, absolutely. Sometimes it's just easier for someone to dictate and direct and be like, hey, let's do this or hey, we got to get this done today. Cool. Let's do it. But on the chance that no one's there, you're not st you know, struck with this decision paralysis, if that makes sense. Percy Hobart treats his men like they're grown ass men and they yeah. absolutely love him for it. And because of that, he gains overwhelming support from the junior officers and enlisted men and he becomes immensely popular. No. Don't like that. <laughs> and because of this, they finally force him out of the military because they sent him down to Africa, intentionally sabotaged him, and yet again, he's managed to turn the entire situation around and turns it into a positive thing. So they just end up getting him fired. In 1940, he is forced into early retirement. On his final departure from Egypt, the men of the 2nd Armored Division lined the entire road to wish him farewell as their sign of how much they actually respected this man. So Percy goes back home, but still wanting to be involved in the military, he joins the Home Guard, which is like the British equivalent of the National Guard. And right. he gets busted down from Lieutenant General to Corporal, which if you don't know Ooh. military ranks, is like going from CEO to front desk receptionist. Not that Ooh. I'm trying to talk bad about receptionists, but I'm trying to give you an accurate depiction of what a drastic change in authority this is. Rough. Five months after Hobart's forced into retirement, the German military rolls into France with tanks, utilizing the Blitzkrieg tactic that Percy Hobart designed and completely stomps the British and the French army in a matter of six weeks. Erwin uh, I'm imagining Percy Hobart's looking at that and he's just like, you son of a, they stole my playbook. <laughs> What is it like, uh, like Waterboy, right? How the other coach is using the one coach's playbook. Oh my God. Like the spice that this man must have felt just like, I see what you're doing. I, inv I invented that. Come on now. Rommel then goes and proceeds well, to rampage through North Africa, it. and the only people that even kind of slow him down are Hobart's men of the 2nd Armored Division they know what that to is do. now known as the 7th Armored Division, aka the Desert Rats. At this so here's the thing, is, and we run into this in games as well, right? I mean, where you have games like Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic the Gathering, video games where one weapon is dominant, like a... Uh, any format of any game where something just becomes so meta relevant or something just becomes the thing that's played, eventually you play it enough that you, you know, oh, well, I mean, if they're just using, say it's just like a quickscope meta, right? Like old Modern Warfare 2 quickscoping, say that's the meta for some reason, right? Because of certain hitboxes maybe or uh, uh, aim assist, right? 
it's like, okay, well, if I do this or I start sliding, I mean, they end up missing their shot. And then thus, that's how you have to understand and play against it enough to have the understanding to know how to counter it. What I'm trying to say is he modernizing what the Mongols did, you know, and effectively writing the modern playbook and, you know, just seeing an iteration of this from, you know, World War II Germany is looking at this and going, well, I know what they're doing. I know where these pain points are and we're going to counter it this way, which I have immense respect for. At this point, Winston Churchill starts asking questions and realizes what his officer corps has done. And he personally calls Percy Hobart back into service and awards him the rank of major general. At which point, all of the officers throw a fit yeah. yet again, saying that he's 57 years old, he's too old to serve in the military, and they try to get him med boarded out. Winston Churchill yet again intervenes and stops the med board and issues this statement, quote, the high commands of the army are not a club. It is my duty to make sure exceptionally able men, even though not popular with their military contemporaries, are not prevented from giving their services to the crown. Trans what an absolute just like chad move translation quit being a bunch of catty bitches we need this guy <laughs> by the time all that political bs gets done rommel is back in europe and he has been tasked with fortifying the atlantic wall the german defense from norway to spain in case the allies should invade yep. rommel reinforces it with 260,000 men manning over 15,000 concrete bunkers and artillery positions the entire thing is coated with barbed wire it has anti-vehicle emplacements to prevent tanks and other vehicles from getting up the beach and they lay over 200 million mines and the man put in and so here's the thing and i think this is what you know uh, even going through idaho i one i didn't quite understand the severity of you know normandy and this 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 iron curtain if you will right which I, I, the actual iron curtain is a different thing but you know what i'm saying with this right the fact that that border was so heavily fortified in your uh, your your work of fictions, the giant wall, uh, the impenetrable wall in which you know you're not supposed to get past or is deemed impossible to pass. It's kind of that. Like, how do you even begin to tackle that? It is so heavily fortified that it is an absolute gist Herculean effort to even attempt to take on this wall. And that's when you start getting into just. You know, not only Normandy, but all the other operations that happened at the same time in order to create a chink in this armor, in this wall, to be able to actually stage and land troops and start landing forces from the West into this part of the world. It is just Herculean that it is just that fortify it is nutty charge of figuring out how to penetrate those defenses is none other than percy hobart he has re-entered the picture and he knows that these kids have been stealing his homework yeah. he comes in with the complete dad energy of i taught you everything you know but i didn't teach you everything i know he <laughs> yeah. takes command of the 79th tank regiment and gets to work immediately it is now major general hobart and erwin rommel going toe-to-toe -to -toe in a battle of wits that will determine the fate of the world and obviously yeah. we're going to handle this issue with tanks which brings us to problem number one how are we going to get tanks on the beach how are we going to get a 70,000 pound hunk of metal with a gun from the boat through the water onto the beach obviously well does it have to be through the boat hypothetically you could airdrop tanks hypothetically i don't know the logistics on that that's entirely possible we just got to make a tank float and it can't be that hard because battleships float right i mean those are big and heavy and made out of metal so why can't we do the same thing with the tank all you have to do is displace enough water and bada bing bada boom you're floating. So all right. we got to do is increase the surface area of a tank. So they take a gigantic tube of wax canvas, wrap it around the tank, and then have inflatable tubes that when they inflate it, the canvas stands straight up. And basically it is a tank inside of a giant canvas tube. And then we'll it. just add a couple of little boat propellers on the back of the tank so it'll push itself through the water. Problem solved. Sound this is absolutely meta stupid works terrific so yeah. now that we've got the sherman duplex drive amphibious tank figured out the next problem what is the beach made out of are the tanks going to get hung up and stuck because we can't have that happening either so here's what we're going to do we're going to take a submarine we're going to send them out they're going to wait till night once night falls the sailors are going to go ashore gather up a bunch of the dirt from the beach and figure out what it's made out of it's right. made out of blue clay probably the worst possible thing because mm -hmm. those tanks will for sure get stuck in clay so right. obviously problem number two how on earth are we going to get the tanks through all this blue clay it would be really nice if we had a road you know what fuck it we're just gonna bring our own road ladies and gentlemen the bobbin <laughs> that is a churchill tank with a gigantic spool of canvas that has metal rods inside of it i'm gonna be honest that is the best thing i've seen like all day this is amazing like i know i say things that are next level this is truly 
just that next level energy like like s tier like a plus like oh that is that is perfect that literally goes ahead first and lays down a road for all the other tanks to drive on right up the beach again it looks really silly but it works super well at this point all the other people that hate hobart are starting to make fun of them they're starting to refer to these tanks as Hobart's funnies, but they have no idea how important these tanks are gonna end up being. Hobart is over here actually trying to save the world by any means necessary. He realizes it doesn't matter how cool it looks, he just needs it to work, and yeah. he only needs it to work once. Yeah. Meanwhile, all of his other contemporaries are worried about looking good while they do it. Okay, problem number three, marching right up the beach. Now we have to worry about the mines and the barbed wire. We can't be blowing the tracks off our tanks with mines. We need to clear the barbed wire for the men, and we don't want the barbed wire getting hung up in the tracks of the tank. What are we gonna do? Things are about to go from looking weird. I feel like the redneck answer to this and I shouldn't have latched on to this. I feel like I'm more redneck than I let on. You gotta get yourself a, <laughs> get yourself a little truck, get a snow plow on it, get some nitro in there. I, I'm sure I'm sure there's some rednecks and engineers in chat that could make this happen very, very easily. <laughs> weird and silly to looking terrifying and awesome because the plan for this is to eat the barbed wire and blow up the mines in front of us yeah, using actually. the Sherman Crab, a.k.a. the flail tank. Okay, so just so we're all on the same page, in theory, we have now figured out how to sail a fucking tank a mile through the ocean, build a road in front of us as we drive it up the beach, cut through barbed wire and detonate eight mines the only defensive structure left is the enormous concrete bunkers with germans inside shooting machine guns and mortars what are we going right. to do about them because normal tank guns aren't going to take those out effectively which is a pretty simple solution if your gun isn't big enough just get a bigger gun ladies and gentlemen the petard it is essentially i love this this is it's so, it's so cute a mortar that is the size of a propane tank affectionately dubbed the flying dust bin you call that big? Yeah, the thing's huge. <laughs> that explains a lot. What is that supposed to mean? You told me eight inches. And you told me you took installments. I didn't know what that meant. That's your problem. Ooh. Interrupting my history time. And it's the flying dust. I love these two. I, I went on this in one of the last videos. The these two are just peak, like, meme, but also peak healthy couple. This is perfect. I, I enjoy this on YouTube. It is very refreshing. Spin doesn't work. This one will. The most terrifying of all of the creations the crocodile, AKA the flamethrower tank, pulling a armored trailer with 500 gallons of jungle jelly capable of shooting flames oh over 250 yards. So if everything- <laughs> laughs in war crime am i right it goes according to plan so far the enemy is either going to be dead or retreating here's the problem once the enemy starts retreating they're also going to start blowing up all the bridges behind them making it very hard to maneuver vehicles especially tanks across ravines rivers ditches and so on so and that's just scorched earth tactics right like if you have to leave a fortify or leave a, not just a fortify position, but leave a position and you need to prevent or uh waylay your pursuers, right? What do you do? You blow up your buildings. You make sure that they cannot recover any of your assets. You make sure that you're putting the uh, the brick of thermite on the the the. Wow, I almost said Hummer on the the Humvee engine block, right? And you just start uh, cleaning house, so to speak. It's just score search tactics, and it's incredibly effective. Look at when uh, G World War II Germany was trying to pursue the USSR into uh, into the USSR proper, and. What did what did the, the the Soviets do at that point in time? They scorched their tactics, all of their their uh, bases, all their supplies, and they made it so that you know it was an uphill battle for the German army to even approach them. Oh, so what are we gonna do once they blow up the bridges? Fuck it, I guess we'll just bring a bridge from home, right? Yeah. No, I'm not messing with you, ladies and gentlemen. Bridge tank. Bridge tank. I love it. This is perfect. Oh man, it went from this is kind of silly and there's no way that's going to work to oh my god, that's terrifying to okay, now you guys are just showing off. And I know what you're thinking, that's great, but what if it's just a little tiny anti-tank ditch or a ravine, not something that really necessitates an entire bridge? Well, that's easy, ladies and gentlemen, the fascine, aka a bundle of sticks. Amazing. So that's it. The plan is set. This man truly has a specialty in tanks and it shows he is able to effectively. It's like the person that, you know, that has like a sedan or a beat like a beat up truck and they can do some really insane like drifts and stuff with it. And you're like, how do you do this? Like they're he's really good at tanks and he can do so many things with tanks. This man lit quite literally thinks in tanks and he's able to effectively approach every problem he is given with the answer of let's bring a tank.
I have immense respect for that. That Hobart has accounted for absolutely everything, and this plan is for sure gonna work. But here's the thing, you've probably seen a bunch of movies or played a bunch of video games that incorporate the landing at Normandy on D-Day, yeah. and you've never seen any of this stuff. So, why is that? That's because most movies and video games, like Saving Private Ryan, for example, take place on Omaha Beach, which yeah. is one of the American beaches, and the Americans didn't have access to all of Hobart's tanks. Mm -mm. Why is that? Well, some people believe that the American leadership saw it and said that it was stupid, not going to work, and they didn't <laughs> want anything to do with them. However, that's a myth, and it's completely untrue. Omar Bradley saw Hobart's inventions and requested all of them. Unfortunately, not enough could be made in time, and the only thing the American forces would be given for D-Day was the Sherman DD duplex drive amphibious tanks right. and the reason that hollywood focuses on omaha beach is because it's the most dramatic it's the one beach of the five where absolutely everything went wrong and believe mm. it or not one of the main things that went wrong was that the sherman duplex drive tanks didn't make it they got released too far off the beach and the seas were too rough and right. a lot of them ended up sinking luckily only five tankers drowned the rest were able to escape and get picked back up by the boats but it was a huge issue not having tanks on Omaha mm -hmm. Beach, and it is part of the reason that Omaha was the deadliest beach on D-Day. If you pay attention and you know what you're looking for, it's even referenced in the Saving Private Ryan movie. No longer has been in the shore. We got no DD tanks on the beach. Dog one is not open. So just so we're all on the same page, the reason most people have never seen or heard about these things is because they weren't at Omaha Beach and Hollywood focuses on Omaha Beach because it was the deadliest, most brutal battle. But the reason that it was the deadliest battle was quite literally in part due to the fact that Hobart's funnies weren't there to help the Allies fight. These tanks are quite literally a victim of their own success. To give you an example of how big of an impact they had on the other beaches, the next deadliest beach after Omaha is Juno, and it had less than half the casualties. But Hobart, wow. the 79th Armored Division's contributions aren't done on D-Day. At this point, Hobart decides rather than keeping all of his men together as one unit, like pretty much every other type of armored unit did, he decided that he was going to split them up and attach them and their specialty tanks to all the other units of the Allied forces. I think it says, it speaks volumes, that the next highest casualty was about half as fatal. That is a huge margin. And it just showcases that, you know, in, in the other uh, the other beaches, especially having that tank support in these tanks really did help with those numbers and really did help to save lives. I mean, once again, if it, it may look stupid, but if it works, it works. It ain't stupid. If it saves lives, it ain't stupid. So in that, that's also, you can also see things like that, not just in Hollywood, but in YouTube as well. Right. I mean, what's going to go, what's going to get pushed in the algorithm more, right? You know, a, uh, you know, Kip reacts to X and it's a pretty reasonable video or is something like, uh, a prank gone wrong at uh, Walmart. Right. And it's a picture of somebody like, you know, like throwing a card or something like that. Right. Which one is the algorithm going to pick up more on which one's getting more engagement. Right. You can absolutely make movies and I'm sure many have been made on the other beaches. However, Omaha is probably the most recognizable at a glance. And that's the peep, the one that people want to hear at your, your average person wants to hear the story about. And it's just, what's going to get that engagement. What's going to get those metrics. You know, what do people want to see? Right essentially turning his tank division into the special forces of tanks. Need to clear some mines? Here's the crab. You need to scare some Germans? Here's the crocodile. By the end of World War II, the Germans were so scared of the crocodile flamethrower tank that they would start to surrender at the mere sight of it. The 79th Armored Division <laughs> and Hobart's Funnies fought all the way through the European theater, and when they finally came up to Germany, the first Allied forces to cross the Rhine into Germany did it in Hobart's duplex drive Sherman tanks. Because because Hobart's funnies and the 79th Armored Regiment were spread out amongst all the other units in the European theater. Every time a unit did something special, credit was given to that unit, and the contributions by Hobart, Hobart's men, and the Hobart funnies would go unnoticed and unrecognized. So in conclusion, this was a story of Major General Percy Hobart, the man that pioneered modern tank warfare. The man that trained the men that beat Rommel in North Africa. The actual inventor of the Blitzkrieg tactic and one of the most important architects of D-Day and the Allied advance through Europe. In the pages of history, he is a victim of his own success because everywhere he wasn't was such a catastrophic shit show that it monopolized the spotlight and everywhere mm. he was, things went so smooth that it wasn't worth reporting, so he went unnoticed. When right. people think of tank warfare in World War II, way too many people think of Erwin Rommel and Heinz Guderian, 
when in reality, they should be thinking of Percy Hobart. And I hope this video helps with that. Thanks for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over the fatelectrician.com. Quack bang out. I didn't even know this man existed. And now I have a cool thing I get to cite to everybody. It's going to be great. I'm going to send this video to people. This video is nothing short of amazing. Oh, I was expecting the outro. No. It, uh, so first off, if you haven't checked out the fat electrician yet, as I know there are people that do find the fat electrician through me, they'll click on some funny VTuber and, oh, he's doing some funny tank videos, right? Do yourself a favor. Check out the fat electrician. He also does have a second channel, the fat files that he does run. Um, he looks like he's starting it up. And as somebody that runs three YouTube channels at this point in time, I can tell you firsthand that it takes a lot of time to run multiple YouTube channels. And, you know, I don't edit things nearly as much or nearly as well as the fat electrician. Very, very great creator. Very straight to the point. Very no BS. Going to tell you what you need to know. We're going to be very personal about what you need to know. So definitely go and support him. I can't wait for him to get over that 2 million subscriber mark. Um... Yeah, I also want to take a second. I am not military personnel. I have family that you know was in the military. I am not military personnel, have not been, probably never will be. There was a little bit of confusion about that recently. So understand that I am a civilian and that I don't have any authority to speak on military affairs, especially modern military affairs. And that is why I defer to you, military personnel, in the comment section. Thank you for taking the time out of your life to do the uh, what you thought is best and uh, to help the world in your own way. It is very, very much appreciated. And I don't think you guys get nearly enough support. But... Alas, did you learn something new in this video? Did you already know all of this? Is there anything or any other of Hobart's funnies that, uh, you know, didn't exactly uh, make it make the cut? You know, uh, any other interesting facts about, uh, you know, the uh, D-Day uh, in broad any other beaches as well? Uh, thoughts on the concept of letting, you know, having one mistake kind of just ruin the rest of someone's life. And even though this person effectively did his part to save the entire world from the uh, access powers, right? You know, one mistake, does that really equate to the entirety of good and the amount of lives this man saved? Let me know in the comment section, all that fun stuff. Definitely go check out the fat electrician and the fat files. And I'll see you all in the next one.